want to um, talk to you today about uh, John chapter 3, and we're going to be going through the first eight verses of John 3. Uh, a lot of people kind of get confused in this chapter and, and uh, trying to clarify a little bit. Let's read, and I'm going to be reading out of the King James. Says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now, Nicodemus, you got to understand that he was a... Um, a ruler of the Jews. He was of the top 70 of Israel, be kind of like the president's cabinet. So when we're dealing with Nicodemus, we're not dealing with um, some uneducated, uh, ignorant human being. We're dealing with a very educated, very um, astute individual. And so you just kind of keep this in the back of your mind as we're perusing through this, that Jesus isn't talking just to an ordinary person. He's talking to somebody that is um, very educated, very intelligent, and um, uh, is one of the rulers of the Jews. Uh, the second verse of John 3 says, the, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. So uh, Nicodemus has the revelation. He said, this this guy, we know he's come from God. He We, we know this. Um, uh, no one can do what he's doing except God's with him. And and and. Go to verse 3, and you look at this, and Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus just kind of blurted it out. He just shot it out there and said, Man, you got to be born again, or you cannot see the kingdom. And and so, now listen, here comes this educated man, this man that is educated, this intelligent guy. And you look at verse 4, and he says, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, you would think. I mean, you really think about this. How can a 6'6 six, six guy enter into a 5'2 mom? I mean, it's literally impossible. But here is this intelligent man asking this, to me, a very ignorant question, okay, of how can he be born again, which isn't ignorant, but he's trying to figure this thing out. And... The problem with Nicodemus here, he's not thinking spiritual. He's speaking or thinking just strictly flesh, carnal, human, okay? And so Jesus tells us in verse 5, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So we see Jesus restating verse 3 a little bit of being born again and then breaking it down into born of water and of the spirit or he cannot enter in verse 3 he says you cannot see the kingdom of God in verse 5 he says you cannot enter the kingdom of God now to enter into the kingdom or to be what Jesus would call born again there has to be a birth and Jesus is telling the, us the birth is going to be about water and it's going to be about spirit now don't get confused about water and don't get confused about the spirit Okay, because he explains in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. So he's separating the, the physical, the flesh. He's separating the flesh. And then he says, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So he's dividing. Nicodemus was thinking flesh. Jesus says, no, I'm talking spirit. So he's dividing the flesh and the spirit here. And then he says uh, in verse 7, marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. And then in verse 8, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell cannot tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Now, so Jesus is telling us, basically, there's got to be a birth of the water, and there's got to be a birth of the Spirit. And then he says in verse 8 that, I'm going to paraphrase here, the wind blows where it wants to, and you hear the sound of it. You cannot tell where it comes or where it goes, and so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So basically, Jesus is telling us that when we receive the Spirit in verse 8, some kind of sound is going to be made. So when you think about the wind, how do I know how do I know the wind's blowing? Well, I mean, if you kind of look back and if there is a little breeze, you'll probably see the leaves rustling just a little bit. That tells me that the wind's blowing. So I see the effects of the wind. Um, if the wind gets a little harder, you're going to feel you're going to feel the wind. And then also one other thing is is when the wind gets really blowing, you're going to be able to hear the wind. And so. Jesus is saying some kind of sound is going to be made, just like the wind blows, some kind of sound is going to be made when you're born of the Spirit. Now, Jesus in his teachings, he, he doesn't go into a whole lot of detail. He always leaves the detailed teaching, especially to the plan of salvation, to his apostles. So to really figure out what he's talking about with water and spirit, sound, 
all that kind of stuff. We got to go to the book of Acts, and we got to look into the book of Acts, and we got to find out what this, see if water shows up, and see if the spirit shows up, and then what happens with those two, okay? And then we're going to find out. So let's go to Acts chapter 2, and we're going to be looking, we're just going to peruse through some, uh, just a few scriptures here today. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time. We're going to look at two. And let's go to the day of Pentecost, and let's look at verse 1 of chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, this is Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, uh, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound. Remember what Jesus said in John 3, 8? Some kind of sound was going to happen. A sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other uh, tongues as the Spirit gives them the utterance. So when these folks in Acts chapter 2, which are the twelve apostles, which is Mary the mother of Jesus, you can go back over to Acts chapter 1 verse 15. In those days Peter stood in the midst of the disciples and said the number of the names were about 120. So verse 14 says they continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. So Jesus' mama is in the upper room. Okay, she receives the Holy Ghost and she begins to speak with other tongues. Now you would think, man, if anybody could get away with not speaking in tongues, it would be Jesus' mama. Well, we see her, according to Scripture, if we tie it together, her in the upper room speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives them the utterance. Because the Bible says in John, or Acts chapter 2, verse 1, they were all filled. So that whole group of 120 were filled. And so the Holy Ghost falls. They're speaking in tongues, and they come out of the upper room. And as they're coming out of the upper room, there's about 16 different nations that are involved in this because it's, it's a day of Pentecost and it's a Pentecost is a festival in, uh, of, of the Old Testament. I'm not going to go into detail with that, but there's a lot of, lot of people gathered together in the town. And verse 12 of Acts chapter 2 says, And they were all amazed and doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? So the, here's the question that they were asking. The lost are asking the people filled with the Holy Ghost, What does this mean? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. But then verse 14 says, But Peter stood up with the eleven and lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken unto my words. Verse 15, For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day, or nine o'clock in the morning. Now Peter does not deny that they're, not, that they're drunk. He just says they're not drunk like you think they are. So they're acting in a way that would seem like, Man, these folks are are drunk but if you go back to verse 13 it said these men are full of new wine now every drunk and back in my old days if you if I drank tequila I was a pinball machine I would just kind of bounce off everything if I if I drank whiskey I passed out if I drank beer you know I, I sat on the couch and watched football if I drank wine you know I'm, I'm I have a different mode so each drunk has a little bit of different mode with them so the people said I've never seen anybody act like this this is this is new wine stuff so Peter gets up and says, man, they're not drunk like you think they are. He didn't deny that they're drunk. He just said they're not drunk like you think they are. And then he goes back into the Old Testament, and he quotes Joel, and he, and he, and he takes his text. Remember, what was the question? What meaneth this? Okay? And then he says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So he's going to explain what their question is. What does this mean? Okay, so he explains it. He quotes, In the last days, saith God, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. On my servants and on my handmaids, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. I'll show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, that was his text. If you ever go to church service, you'll hear a preacher get up and he'll quote his text. Well, what's the name of his message? The name of his message is, this is that. The question asked to them is, what meaneth this? He says, well, let me quote my text and let me give you the name of my message. This is that. And then he starts preaching. And he goes down and he preaches in verse 23 and verse 24 that um, Jesus would be crucified, he'd be slain, and God would raise him up. That's just simply the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You have to hear the gospel before you can be saved. You've got to die to your sin. 
That's repentance. You've got to get buried in Jesus' name. That's baptism, just like Jesus was buried. And then Jesus, did Jesus stay in the tomb? No, he rose again the third day. When I receive the resurrection power, I will speak in another tongue as the Spirit gives the utterance, and that resurrects me out of my old life and into a new life. So you have to hear the gospel to be saved. And then he talks about David being, uh, his body left to, to be in corruption. But if you jump down here, and let's look at verse um, 30, 33 of Acts 2. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, which he had shed forth this, which ye now what? Which ye now see and hear. Now, if you jump back to John 3, 8, I don't mean to be too confusing here, but the wind blows where it listeth. Now, here's the sound that you hear, and you see the effects of the wind. So they saw and they heard the effects of the Spirit. Okay? So verse 34 says, For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy uh, foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all of the house of Israel know it surely that God hath made that same Jesus, that same Jesus, whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, he's actually talking to the folks that led Jesus to Calvary. He, he led him to Pilate, told him, they screamed and yelled at him, crucify him. So here are the, here are the murderers of the Messiah. Now, if you think you've done anything worse than murdering the Messiah, Hey, call me, and, and I would sure would like to hear what worse than murdering the, murdering the Messiah is. But, but so, so I want to show you that there's no sin that God cannot forgive. There's nothing that God cannot forgive, okay? So I don't care how bad you've been. I don't know how, how, how because i got too much. No, sir. If you have done more than murdering the Messiah, then, then you know, I'm showing you folks that even those folks can be saved here. So now watch. In verse 37... Now, when they heard this, they were pricked, or they were convicted. God put conviction on them through Peter's preaching, pricked in their heart, and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? So here's the church preaching to these murders of the Messiah. He, he looks at him and says, Man, what do I need to do? And so Peter's going to give them a nutshell response. And he says, Peter said to them in verse 38, Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. That's water. Remember, Jesus said you got to be born of water. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? To get your sins washed away. It, we can't carry the guilt of sin around with us. Okay. The, I look at baptism as a guilt trough. It washes away my guilt. It washes away every, every, every sin that I've ever committed. So I come up out of the water, it's going to be like I've never sinned before. So I repent. I ask God to forgive me. I go to Calvary. I, I get forgiveness from Christ. I forgive myself. I go to the water. I get my sins washed away. But then watch what Peter says. For the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, that same Holy Ghost that they did in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. So when they received it, what was the sound made? They spoke with other tongues. So Peter's given them the response of repentance, water baptism and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and then verse 39 says for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off even as many as the Lord our God shall call guess what God's still calling today he's not stopped calling that 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 same message of, of Acts chapter 2 is still alive and well there's nowhere in the Bible where you can see where this message God said change the message it's still intact this is the original blueprint of the church preaching to the lost, okay? And we've got water involved, and we've got spirit involved. But right, folks, it doesn't stop here. If you go on and you peruse through Scripture, you'll find in Acts chapter 8 the same sequence of events. People saying, man, what, what do we need to do? And then Philip preaches in Acts chapter 8 about repentance, baptism, and the, John comes down, prays for John, Peter and John come down, pray for them. It doesn't stop there. It goes to Acts chapter 10. And, and it preaches the same message to a bunch of Gentiles, okay? That they, they hear the word of God. The Holy Ghost falls in them. They speak with other tongues. When the Spirit falls, the evidence is speaking with other tongues. That's what's true with Scripture. To re, you got to remain harmonious with the Bible. You can't just take one portion of Scripture out and say, well, this is what this means. I'm taking one portion of Acts 2.38, but I'm showing you the fulfillment of it continuing on through the book of Acts. It, the 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 point is at John 3 5 Jesus said you got to be born of water and of the spirit the water here is not the busting of the water in the womb 
the water here is Jesus name baptism that's where water supplied you got to stay consistent because when we went to Acts 2 we didn't hear anything about a womb being broken when we go to Acts 8 we didn't read anything about a womb the water being broken in the womb you go to Acts chapter 10 you don't see anything else referring to that but when we do look at water we see water baptism and we see the purpose for it is to wash away sin now when you go to Acts chapter 10 and you talk to Cornelius which was a Gentile he preaches, Peter preaches, the Holy Ghost falls on them. Well, how did he know the Holy Ghost fell? Because they heard them speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. That's how they knew a sound was given, just like Jesus said in John 3, 8. But then Peter says, can any man forbid water? This is in verse 46. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, can, in verse 47, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we, and he commanded them in verse 48 baptism wasn't a suggestion baptism was a command he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord so this Jesus name baptism isn't a suggestion this born of water isn't whether you want to or not this is a command given all the way back if you study it completely out you go all the way back to Jesus Christ and the in the Great Commission he's command go teach baptize and you, they, they're going to receive the Spirit. You'll see that in Luke chapter 2. You'll read that in Mark 16. You'll see that in Matthew 28. Though this is the, you'll see it in John 20. This is the great commission of Jesus giving this commission, talking to them about repentance, baptism, and the Holy Ghost. The same thing that John said in John 3, 5, born of water and spirit. It goes consistently through Scripture. It is the method of being born again. But guess what? In Acts chapter 10, it doesn't stop. He finds some certain disciples, Paul does, in Acts chapter 19. And this is where I really want to go with this. And this is Acts chapter 19. And let's look at verse 1. It came to pass while Paul, or while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus finding certain disciples. Now these folks that Paul is coming across are certain church folks. These are followers of, of God. Okay, And he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And that is a powerful question that we need to be asking. And that's what I'm asking you today. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, we've not heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. So they hadn't even heard about the Holy Ghost speaking with the tongues. They didn't have any of that. So guess what? What, what does John or Paul do here? And he said unto them, unto what were you baptized? Now, if baptism isn't important, then why is Paul asking them, well, what, what was your mode of baptism? And they said unto him, well, we were baptized under John's baptism. Well, that was the mode of baptism for that day. If that question was asked today, if we bring Acts chapter 19 into the 21st century, that question would be, well, we were baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And though so what Paul would do is to explain that baptism, like I'm fixing to explain it. Matthew 28, 19 tells us to go baptize. That's Jesus' command to the, to the apostles, to the 11 apostles, go into all the world, baptize them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. So we're, we're, look at that scripture very closely. Matthew 28, 19. In the name of, we're looking for a single name, and we're looking for the name of the Father, we're looking for the name of a single name of the Son, and a single name of the Holy Ghost. So let's make it break it down really simple. What is the name of the Son? Well, we know that's Jesus. When you really get to studying your Bible out, you ask the question, what is the name of the Father? You'll find out that Jesus said, I have come in my Father's name. Well, what name did he come in? He came in the name of Jesus. So the name of the Father is Jesus. Well, you talk about what is the name of the Holy Ghost. Well, in John 14, Jesus talked about the Comforter, whom the Father will send in my name. So we find out the name of the Holy Ghost is Jesus. So when the apostles are baptizing in Jesus' name in the book of Acts, they're not changing what Jesus said. They're just fulfilling what he said. Matt, Jesus did not intend for us to repeat Matthew 28, 19. He intended us to fulfill Matthew 28, 19. And so when we read through the book of Acts, we're going to find out where every time anybody was ever baptized in the scripture, it was only done in Jesus' name. In Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19, and, and Acts chapter 22 when Paul was baptized, it, calling on the name of the Lord. There's five places in scripture that talk about Jesus' name baptism and one place that mentions being baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Five against one. I don't know, in my book, if I was a betting man, which I'm not, but if I was, I would think I would go with the five and not with the one. Okay? Now, so he said, unto what were you baptized? They said, unto John's baptism. So Paul explains John's baptism. 
in verse 4, Then said Paul, John barely baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that should believe on him, which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. Now watch what happens when he gets done explaining John's baptism. Verse 5 says, And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So Paul rebaptizes people that were already baptized. That's powerful, folks. I was baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And then when I found out the revelation of Jesus' name, I got rebaptized, just like these folks in John chapter 19. Okay? And guess what? So we see water here, right? He's baptizing them, just like Jesus said in John 3, 5. But what's left? There's something still left. Let's see. And verse 6 says, And when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So when the Holy Ghost fell on them, they begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gives them the utterance, and they begin to prophesy. So what is the evidence of the Holy Ghost? Speaking with other tongues. It's consistent throughout Scripture. The mode of baptism or the mode of water is baptism. The mode of the Spirit is evidence with speaking with other tongues. So go back to Acts chapter 2 and look at verse 38. Then said Peter unto them, Repent, ask God to forgive you of all your sins, go to Calvary's cross, let the old man die out and let a new man become born. So I die out to my old lifestyle. And so I'm dying at Calvary's cross. Well, what do you do with the dead person? You bury him. Okay? That's normal tradition. We bury. And so we get buried with him, according to Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. We're buried with him into baptism, unto death. So I get buried with him. And when you go under, you've got to make sure that the Jesus name is called over you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Why? Because that's the way it was. That's the way they did it in the book of Acts. Okay? The, and then they come up out of the water. The Holy Ghost is the evidence. Okay? Just like Jesus was buried, what came into Jesus' body is the same spirit that he had before, before he died. That same spirit came in. That's why it's called a ghost. Don't get freaked out about ghosts. It's just the spirit of Christ. Okay, that resurrection power, that spirit of Christ came back into that tomb, went, went inside that dead body of Jesus Christ and resurrected it. Okay, so just like it resurrected Jesus, that, that same spirit needs to come into my life and resurrect me out of my old life. That's what gives me the power to be able to live for God. So God now, so I've got my past taken care of through repentance and water baptism. I got my present and my future taken care of by the power of the Holy Ghost. Folks, you cannot do this without the Holy Ghost. The, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is essential. You must have it if you're going to live a victorious life over sin. I thank you for your time today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this privilege to be able to talk to your folks today. God, I pray for an anointing. God, to rest upon us. Give us an ear to hear what the Spirit's trying to say to us today. Let the power and the resurrection of your Spirit do a work, Father, and we'll give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you.